Welcome back everybody and today we're going to finish up power as we take a look at politics and power. And yes, politics goes on. Uh, it's not just something that's applied in Washington, uh, but you also see it in the boardroom as well. So today let's go ahead and take a look at power and politics. Okay everybody, let's uh, continue on with the uh, last portion of chapter 13 and today we're going to be looking at politics. I really didn't understand the pervasiveness of politics and how much of a impact it had on organizations and I'm just as I'm talking I'm just panning out this whole slide. Um, I really didn't understand how pervasive politics was uh, until I got up into positions of leadership in the military and in civilian life. Uh, politics really, in most every organization I've ever been in, there was some degree of politics within it. Now what is politics? Politics, uh, social influence, attempts directed at those who can provide rewards that will help promote or protect the self-interest of the actor. Uh, and the pervasiveness of it, it's a fact of life in work organizations. Uh, employees are negatively affected by politics and they tend to perceive politics as a bad influence and employees whose interests are advanced by politics tend to view it as a useful tool. So it just depends on what side of the coin you fall on. The One of the, I guess, most most political organization I've ever worked for was in a government organization. I won't mention it because it's a fairly popular uh, branch of government in uh, Shelby County, but when I started to work for this place, I couldn't believe the amount of political uh, jockeying, coalitions, people were behaving in ways that you know, it was, they didn't try to hide it. They were vying for positions in that organization. And it was kind of like the days of Rome where they were just waiting to uh, assassinate Caesar so the next person could go up in line. And there was a lot of backstabbing and there were a lot of uh, uh, manipulating and all of that just to be able to move up the ladder. Oftentimes people who were negatively impacted, looked at the organization negatively, but those who were benefiting from it didn't see any problem with it. Uh, me, I really didn't have any political aspirations at all, so I was able to view it as a spectator uh, just looking at it, but it was amazing to see how alliances were formed, how people were vying for different positions of favor and so forth with the uh, chief decision makers and all of that. So, and if it's that bad at that level, which was just a lower level job in, uh, in Shelby County, can you imagine the type of political behavior that goes on in Washington where people every day, it's a chess match uh, where you're vying for positions of power and you're giving and taking and all of that. I'm glad the Lord called me to teach and to go into ministry because I don't think I would survive uh, within that atmosphere, but there are people who, who thrive on it. But that's really the nature of politics in organizations. Now, when it comes to uh, organizational politics, it's affected by organizational culture and individual employees. Yeah, uh, in political arenas, that culture is going to be political and everything it does is going to be based on a political type of uh, uh, perspective and more, more likely uh, to occur in ambiguous, uncertain environments. I didn't experience any of that. I mean, most people knew if you were going to advance, this is uh, how you do it. You've got to play the game. Uh, you've got to follow the unwritten rules. Now, uh, and that may be really what they're talking about here, following the unwritten rules that aren't in an employee manual or in a uh, uh, mission statement, but the things that aren't spoken but are understood. If you're going to get by in here, in this organization, 
you've got to do this, this, and this. Uh, and can the constructive politics are unnoticeable. So I've never really seen where politics and constructive have gone in the same sentence in most of the organizations where I've worked. So uh, uh, usually it's just a matter of establishing a pecking order. And if you're going to get to the top, this is how you have to do it. When it comes to organizational politics, again, a workplace perceived as highly political uh, creates greater job anxiety. Yeah, uh, I saw that a lot. Uh, people were stressed out because they didn't want to offend the ones who had sway over their careers. So they were um, apprehensive. They were uh, very uh, territorial and defensive a lot of times. And one thing that I did notice, again, when it came to a, a highly political uh, environment, there was little cohesion. Now, people had alliances, don't get me wrong. Uh, they had to form alliances to be able to survive in some of these environments. But there was little uh, positive motivation, cohesion, at least to the extent where people wanted to come together and uh, solve problems and advance the organization they were more concerned about advancing their careers. There's greater inattention uh, or greater intentions to leave. And many people uh, who were in that did leave uh, when they realized that they didn't have what, the, uh, what it took to be able to move up. I left. Uh, I didn't want to be a part of that environment. Uh, I wanted to be able to have something more stable and honorable than to... Uh, uh, worry about being someone's uh, lackey uh, just to be able to go up the, the corporate ladder. Their lower job and supervisor satisfaction, yeah, I didn't see a whole lot of that where I worked uh, unless you were the one being promoted. If you were the in-group, you had it made. If you were the out-group, not so much. And as a result, the out-group... Uh, you know, really was not included or incorporated that well into the organization. So naturally, their uh, morale was going to suffer for it and oftentimes productivity. And this isn't just my experience. I've talked to many individuals who uh, have taken my classes who work in organizations like this, both within government and outside government. Uh, and in those environments, they see this pretty much the same thing people who are terrified to make a wrong move or to offend those who have sway over their careers. Uh, they just follow along whether it's right or wrong. They're not going to challenge anything. They're just going to do what they need to do, uh, check off the blocks so that they can advance. And that's really all it was. It was self-preservation and self-edification. Uh, uh, you have lower organizational commitment. Yeah, it's all about the people, and uh, you're not worried about advancing the organization. You're there to advance your career, and again, you have lower productivity as a result of that. And more actual political behavior, as you see here, if employees think they're in a political environment, they'll engage in political behavior themselves. So uh, again, it's play the game. Uh, just do your time, do what you have to do, and you will advance or you'll do well or whatever. Just don't cross the wrong people. Causes of political behavior. Well, what I've noticed, and your textbook talks about uh, uh, these types, but there are uh, those in power who perpetuate political behavior. You do what I say, you follow me, you support me, one hand washes the other, or you wash my back and I'll wash yours. So uh, there's that. Now, there is conflict. Of course, when you have conflict uh, and uncertainty, you're going to normally gravitate to those who are like-minded, who have like values, who you can uh, uh, call upon, just like in the game Survivor, uh, when there is uh, uh, competition and so forth, you're normally going to try to group together their strength in numbers, so uh, that's the beginning of political behavior. 
uncertainty. If there are no clear rules, people make them up themselves. And even when there are clear rules, there are written rules and there are unwritten rules uh, that you can go by. Scarcity of valued resources, again, there we go. Uh, when things are unique and there's no substitute for it, then you have bargaining chips uh, in action. And that's just going along to get ahead. And again, it's play the game, uh, keep your nose clean, do what the uh, person over you says to do, and you'll advance. Organizational politics that reward employees who engage in political behavior or punish those who don't. And that goes with the in-group and the out-group. Uh, the in-group people are going to follow along. You get into the uh, phenomenon of groupthink a lot of times. Groupthink means that whatever the um, person in power wants, that's what he or she gets. If they're looking for opinions, you're not going to go against the the grain, you're just going to go along with everybody so that you're not the stick in the mud. And uh, it's one of those things, just be quiet and ride it out. And eventually you'll rise to the top yourself and then you can keep perpetuating it as you had to endure it. Now, political behavior can be reduced according to the textbook uh, by formal rules and pr procedures clear job expectations, open communication, uh, managers who confront poorly behaving employees, managers who serve as a good role model. Uh, and managers and leadership really are the ones who will either make or break a political environment. Um, I have been in, uh, again, when I was working for government, uh, mayors would expect you to toe the line, to do what you wanted them to do. Uh, and that went down to the city officials, to the city managers and supervisors. Everybody followed suit with the mayor. It didn't make a difference what the rules were. You just played the game. And um, so when we talk about uh, formal rules and procedures, folks, you have a textbook world and then you have a real world. The textbook world will tell you you can reduce it, and you can, I guess, with formal rules and procedures, but you have to enforce those. It's one thing to write it on paper or put it in a manual, but it's another thing to enforce it. So uh, having them and enforcing them, yeah, can reduce political behavior. Uh, keeping the number of subordinates assigned to each manager at a reasonable level and understanding the motivations and aspirations of subordinates. Really, I've never seen that being a consideration. The subordinates have always been expected to toe the line to follow the, uh, the leader, uh, to do whatever the leader says, and as long as you play ball, uh, go by the uh, unwritten rules, then you will uh, do well in this company. If you go across the grain, then that's when you get into trouble and you find yourself on the out, not only out of the group, but sometimes out of a job. Now, impression management. Uh, it's a word you might not have heard of before, but it's the process of portraying a desired image or attitude to control the impression others form of us. It's really how we come across, and it goes back to that ability to uh, have people uh, trust you, uh, endear them to you, and so forth. And it comes from sometimes a persuasive power. It comes through charismatic leadership, uh, but involves self-monitoring, uh, having a high concern with others' perceptions of us and adjusting our behavior uh, to fit the situation. Uh, so it's not just how we perceive ourselves, but to be able to have a sensitivity to how others perceive us. And um, having that sensitivity uh, to how other people perceive us is very important. There was a study done one time on a Fortune 500 company, and the researchers surveyed the managers, and they asked the managers, how would you rate the employees' satisfaction here? How's their morale? How is their motivation? And they just gave everybody high marks. And really what they were doing is patting themselves on the back, thinking that they were just great managers and the people loved them. Well, after they finished with the managers, they sent the employees a survey on job satisfaction, morale, and uh uh, just motivation. And it turned out that the employees were ready to 
uh, go on strike because they were highly upset with management, but management was oblivious to it because they stayed in their office. They didn't get out and uh, really interact with the employees. They just thought since there was no uh, rising up of the uh, employees to revolt against them, everything was great. But in fact, their lack of attention to the employees almost caused them to go on strike. So it's not enough that you have a, uh, a perception of yourself. What others perceive you to be also is important, and that's impression management, having a good impression upon people. Now, when it comes to furthering impression management, uh, these are just some um, just some little quips that you can uh, take on. Elevated speaking pitch, um, speech errors and pauses, negative statements, greater views of no, can't, and won't, um, eye shifting. These are ways that can indicate that you're not telling the truth, that you're not being straightforward, fidgeting, fondling, manipulating objects, using fewer gestures and keeping the head still, and so forth. So a tell is a giveaway uh, where you're giving away yourself to, uh, uh, to the people who are watching you and so forth. In poker, they talk about tells. You don't want to make facial expressions. You don't want to fidget or move your hands uh, because that can give the people at the poker table an idea of what you're holding. If you crack a smile when you get four aces, then every time you crack a smile, that's usually a giveaway or a tell that you're holding something high and you can you know, lose, I guess, the poker game. Uh, not that I play poker or even know about it, but I know that a tell is where we get that from. But these are ways that you can tell that uh, something is just not right uh, with that uh, uh, leader or that uh, situation or whatever when they start doing that. Uh, in fact, detectives will tell you when they go in and interrogate uh, suspects, they look for these things as well when they're given their... Uh, testimony or whatever, uh, they're looking for shifting eyes and uh, maybe sweating or fidgeting or whatever or looking a certain way. And uh, by doing that, that's a tell that there's something wrong, that the person may not be giving the right uh, uh, information or truthful information. But it's the same in leadership. I mean, when you're doing that, uh, a person who knows what to look for can tell if that uh, leader is uh, lying or uh, holding back or misrepresenting and so forth. But uh, these are the things that you need to control. If you're just naturally like that, I would work on it uh, to try to downplay it or to reduce the amount of it because it can, for some people who know to look for these things, uh, it can be a, uh, a, a negative attribute and have negative consequences for you. I know there are people, if a person can't look at me, if they're constantly looking away, I have a problem with that. I'm just used to looking at people straight in the eye and talking to them, but that seems to be, for some people, intimidating. Uh, but just something as simple as that can uh, ruin a person's impression of you. So you want to be mindful of these things to try as much as you can, uh, avoid them, and to uh, uh, form as favorable uh, an impression uh, as you can. Well, folks, this is all we have for this week. When it comes to power and politics, we've looked at the different dimensions of politics and power and how you can accumulate it and how important these areas are if you're going to be effective and maintain longevity in an organization. So we'll wrap it up for this week. Uh, next week, we'll move on to chapter 14. But until then, you have a good weekend. God bless you. And we will see you next week. Everyone, today we saw politics and how politics and conflict and power all interplay. You know, it's an unfortunate reality that politics does occur not only just uh, in the uh, business world and in government, but it also 
uh, occurs in your ministry. Uh, whenever you get people together, you're going to have that element come in. So understanding it, uh, knowing how to recognize it, and knowing how to deal with it is going to be important for the success of your uh, operation, whether it's from a uh, secular standpoint or whether it's from a ministry standpoint. Well, that's all we have for today. God bless you. Have a good weekend, and we'll start back next week with Chapter 14.